to Old Fashioned Finance, the podcast that mixes cocktails and high finance. I'm your host, Caleb Frankert, and I'm joined today by my good friend and fellow money muddler, Jason Burnell. Caleb, can a podcast about finance be entertaining? You know it! Not without alcohol! <laughs> <laughs> that was impromptu. <laughs> It turns out it can be with alcohol. Okay, cool. Did you like my handsome, handsome Dan impression or uh, I did. the Mr. Scream? Yeah. Yeah. You said the other day we should watch Wayne's World again. And wow. I don't know why I just got the urge to, yeah. <laughs> Remember, it's Wayne's World 2. They it go is. into the radio station. And yeah. They're like, that's Handsome Dan. But right. he's Mr. Scream. And then Handsome Dan's the goof, the guy that looks more like us. Yeah. Not handsome. <laughs> yeah. He's <laughs> middle aged and balding. Yeah. Yeah. Big nose. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Wayne's World. Not what I had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, this is part two of our new series. Ah. Two parts. Our financial oh, wait, this is freedom a series. series. Go ahead. Say say the say the thing. Freedom! <laughs> Part two. So last week we discussed what financial freedom looks like, what steps you have to take to establish financial freedom in your 20s and 30s. Jason, we're going to talk about our 40s and 50s today. How exciting. All right. We're, we're, we're almost there. <laughs> Some of us are closer than <laughs> others. <laughs> and uh, this week we are still using our freedom barrel aged or sorry, barrel rusted gin. Rested. Um, yes. Yeah. We're going to use this one again next God week. This gin. <laughs> gin. <laughs> I liked how it played in an old fashioned. We're going to do something a little bit different with this one. And yep. we're going to do a, uh, a martini. Yeah. Because a real martini consists of gin, not vodka. Remember, right. yes. folks. Yeah. Vodka, vodka. What's that? Yeah. Garbage water. Garbage. <laughs> it's vile potato water. We've talked about it before. <laughs> so I'm just want to get out in front of this and, and offend everybody who likes vodka that's listening to the show. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I think of gin and the first mixed drink that comes to my mind is a martini. Yes. So how does a barrel aged slash barrel rusted gin play in a martini? Well, I went back and I used a what was his name? David Embry. Right, right. <laughs> we used a David Embry type recipe, which sure. is heavier on the booze. We got, you know, basically a little bit of vermouth in there. This actually, while I was mixing it, and I'll go through the, the details here in a second, is very close to the gen old fashion that it we is. made last week. It's it very, very close. Yeah, I was uh, like a little concerned because I am not a martini fan. No, I know you're not. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm practicing. <laughs> and I love a martini. A, yeah. a really I I love a good dirty martini. Yeah. Uh with the olive brine and the, yeah. you know, stuffed olives. I think it makes a wonderful drink. With the barrel rested gin, I got to say I've I've had something similar to this in the past. Mm -hmm. I tried a dirty martini and it just does not work out right. So, I went to the more classic recipe. Um you know, the Dave Embry recipe, which is just a dry martini. So let's talk a little bit about what we're sipping on here. Sure. This is two and a half ounces of, in our case, Freedom Barrel Rested Gin. Which we know we like. Yeah, we like it. <laughs> and again, th so this is not phenomenal stuff. No. It's, it's, uh, it's just a different take on gin. It's kind of like a whiskey take on, it's on really gin. A, it's a gimmick. I mean, it's, sure. It really I is. like that it said freedom, and we were talking about <laughs> yeah, financial America freedom. All over it. Yeah, and it, yes, the bottle screams America. <laughs> Grab your belt buckle. So anyway, two and a half ounces of the Freedom Barrel Rusted Gin, a half an ounce of dry vermouth, Folks, you can find this on the grocery store shelves, right. Martini and Rossi, mm -hmm. or what's the other one? Gallo, I think. I would say like anything, a little bit of this goes a long way. So if you spend right. a little bit more on a nicer bottle, it'll definitely be worth the investment yeah, in a bottle. Yeah, if you just go down the with. Kroger aisle and you're like just pulling one off, it, it it's not... It'll work. It'll work. It'll work in a pinch, but it's... Yeah, if you can get your well, hands on like a Dolan, and I right. think that's what we used in this one, was right. a Dolan. Or no, I take it back, Carpano. It was Carpano. Yes. Yep. Carpano yeah, and, dry I mean, vermouth. And you, that is a nicer vermouth. It is. And it's still somewhat readily available. You're it not going to find it at the grocery store necessarily, but if you look a little bit, you can find it on, on a lot of liquor store shelves and things like sure. that. A little bit more money, in my opinion. A dry vermouth can make or break a martini. Yeah. So think of Manhattan's, Jason, which we, we love Manhattan's mm. and... Vermouth is the game changer it in is. that one. And I didn't know that early on. Like, I had no idea. Who would know? We're learning so much about cocktails <laughs> through this podcast. It's such a <laughs> grind. I don't know how we've gotten through this. Well, a lot of research, which I'm okay with. <laughs> 
So in, in a nutshell, two and a half ounces of barrel rusted gin, a half an ounce of dry vermouth, pick your poison, similar to the old fashioned. Yep. A dash, just a dash of orange bitters. And we garnish this one with a lemon peel. Which also worries me. You'll be okay. We, <laughs> in the old fashioned, though, we used orange bitters yep. and lemon peel. And really, the, the difference here is we have, we've taken out the simple syrup and replaced that with dry vermouth, which does change it entirely. So right. we could talk about it for a long time, or we could take a sip on this yeah, and I see mean, what we think. Enough talking. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, that's just okay for me. Um, it's different. Yeah. I kind of like it. Not gonna lie, I'm not a fan of just the regular dry. What's this that we're drinking? Martini. <laughs> the regular dry martini. It's a little boring. I, I think, think the barrel rusted gin. It, it adds a little something to it. Oh, definitely. Yeah, but I, again, like I'm not, I'm not a martini fan, so it's hard for me to say like. And I don't know. Maybe it is the vermouth that I don't. The dry. It could vermouth. be. Yeah. Could be. Lemon is just like it's like a warning sign for me in any <laughs> drink. Like. We got to put a lemon in there to ruin it is what it feels like. It's kind of, it's boring. That's what I'm going to say. You think so? Okay. Yeah. Um, Very, it's dry too, you know. I'm a big martini fan. My favorite cocktails are Manhattans. And the next thing that I would typically make is a martini. I'm going to go with a dirty martini. The dirtier, the better. But I like salty, briny. I, right. I like olives. If you don't like olives, don't waste your time. Yeah. But then I would put this one next personally before just going to the classic dry martini, which is regular gin, you know, London dry gin, of course. I don't think there's any bitters. No, there's not. There's no bitters. So I think the orange bitters and the barrel rested, there's a little bit of oakiness to me that adds just, just a, it's nuanced. It's very nuanced. Yeah. But you compare this to like any drink with bourbon in it, you know? Well, that's a different story I mean, altogether, my friend. Like, if you want oakiness, you know, you want to yeah. get hit by an oak two by four, this is missing all of that. And I think what it is for me is it's the dryness and the vermouth, okay. which I just don't, I don't prefer and I don't like a dirty martini at yeah. all because I don't like olives. Because you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Get over here. We're going to fight. <laughs> uh, so I like it. I don't love it. I don't hate it. What I'm getting from you is when in doubt, just drink whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with We're that. We're pretty good with that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So cool. Let's talk about what financial freedom looks like. We, we And we'll recap freedom. real briefly. You, go ahead. Do it. <laughs> So financial freedom in your 20s and 30s, you know, we're assuming that we're taking some of that advice from our 20s and 30s to set up the 40s and 50s. Yeah, if you didn't take that advice, today. go listen to the last yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah, if you're in your 40s and you go, you listen to some of the things that we talk about here today, you're in your, your 40s and your 50s and you go, yeah, but now what do I do? I'm I'm not here yet. Well, go back to the what to do in your 20s and 30s because the steps are the same. Yeah, that does not give you like license to go out and like open every credit card you can find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't go back and, and so let me I'm clarify. Scr I'm screwed. I'm just going to go <laughs> buy a Lexus on a lease and like... <laughs> go back to the solutions yeah, from the correct. episode uh, in, uh, of our, our 20s and 30s. Sure. The, the paying down debt aggressively and things like that. So we're going to kind of assume that you have gotten to that point in your 40s and 50s. What logically is the next step? So we're just going to kind of dive into that. But I will recap. You hit on credit cards and you know student loan debt and right. consumer debt and all those things that we accumulate in our 20s and 30s because we're told we need to do that to build credit and well we got to buy a house and we got to buy a car and, sure you know we, we have to do all these things and then we get into our our late 20s and 30s and go why wait why do i have to do all these things why did i do these things <laughs> this seems complicated yeah, well you don't have to like, so whenever you realize that that's not the case and you don't want to go through and do those things wherever your journey starts uh, hopefully it's before you get to your 40s and 50s because this is really your 40s and 50s are typically your prime earning years, Jason. Yeah. And this, this is where you really make hay, right? Yeah. DEF CON 3, at least, you know, you're getting close to the time where you're going to be bidding them farewell and you need to be kind of, especially in your 50s, mm -hmm. hyper focused, know what the end game is. I mean, and it, maybe again, you can choose to work longer, but it's nice to know that sometimes you don't have to. So it, it is, yeah. just, it's critical time. Well, I think we're talking about financial freedom here. So right. what, what you just said there is something that we're definitely going to talk about in the next episode, which is working because sure. you want to versus have to. Exactly. That's huge. But I, I kind of look at your 40s and 50s, especially your 50s, like you touched on, as kind of the retirement red zone. Sure. 
no, you don't have to be ready to retire, but you're getting close. Right. And screw ups in your 40s and 50s are a little bit harder to remedy than in your 20s and 30s, right? Yeah. And I mean, we've seen so many examples of that. So avoid those splurges and just make sure you communicate with your spouse <laughs> like always. But, you know, I think, you know, some of the, the simple ideas that we talked about in the last episode apply here to, you know, clean up. Definitely. Debt. Yeah. I mean, let's uh, talking about the debt. We, you know, cleaning up consumer debt. Well, let, let's chop it up into right. three categories. Sure. And, and, and I'm going to just summarize what we talked about last time. I very passionately at the end of that podcast said, remember, we're talking about freedom and think about what you're willing to trade your financial freedom for. Is right. it a car? Is it a college education? I mean, I'm, I'm, there's, I'm not saying right, wrong, or indifferent. Just you're, you're talking, you're, you start with zero debt, right? right? You start with financial flexibility. That's your freedom. That's your ticket. Exactly. Think long and hard about what you're willing to trade that for. So let's break this up kind of like we did the last time. I want to touch on three topics really and kind of then dive into those uh, individually. But we're going to look at debt. What should the debt picture look like? Yep. What about savings? And then I, I said cash flow in this. I think you know what I mean. We'll we'll see when we get there. But let's talk about debt, Jason, in sure. your 40s and 50s. What mm-hmm. should your what should our relationship with debt be in our 40s and 50s? Well, it needs to be very healthy at this point. <laughs> <laughs> really, the the debt that you really should be working towards only having is a mortgage, mm-hmm. and you're probably going to be. You know, hopefully working towards aggressively getting this thing taken care of. I see in this age group a lot of folks like, oh my gosh, we got we paid our home mortgage off, and then they go buy a lake house. Yeah. Okay. Don't do that. And it, it may be fine, but you know you need. It might be. Yeah. It and, might be. And and it's just we want to make sure that it's it might be very calculated. It might be perfectly fine for your situation, but. Getting through debt and not having a mortgage till the day you die is not a great financial plan. You know what? I think that's something let's come back to because when we we talk about the next step, you know, like like you said, it might be fine. It might be okay. Don't go accumulate debt just because you've paid all your debt off, right? Like we're right. going to have a mortgage, so let's go get a mortgage on a, a vacation home. We're not saying that that's wrong. But I think what we have to look at, and we'll come back to this, is let's check some other boxes before we do that. Sure. So, you know, as far as the debt relationship, I think personally consumer debt, that's a very broad term, but consumer debt is what you definitely want to stay away from. And you want to, you kind of want to be out of that in your forties and fifties to really make hay and make damage, you know, on some of these other items. So when I say consumer debt, credit cards, yep, auto loans, mm-hmm. personal loans, mm. like the unsecured stuff, right? Yeah. 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 I think we can make a mess of ourselves with $3,000 personal, you know, sign your signature here mm-hmm. and you get a $3,000 loan or transferring credit card balances. That nonsense has to stop in, yeah. the, in this age group. One of the best things you can do is just stop using the credit card. Mm-hmm. Okay. Those points aren't worth it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is worth it for the credit card company. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is just such a lesson of behavioral finance. Like it, how it changes your psychology to swipe and how we spend so much more. So yeah, I mean, that stuff needs to be cleaned up. Working towards a good spending plan budget Mm -hmm. will help avoid the, oh my gosh, I need a new car and I don't have a dime to rub together. In your spending plan, you should be, you should be saving that car payment to yourself. Yeah. If you've had the ability to pay off that, those car loans. I just think a lot of this is like arranging your spending plan properly not digging a deeper hole when it comes to consumer debt. Well, yeah. So going back to the 20s and 30s, we talked a lot about not digging the hole in the first place, budgeting, yeah. uh, being on the same page as your spouse, all those things. Hopefully you've done that in your 20s and, and 30s so that you, basically you get to your 40s and 50s. You have all your faculties available, right? You have <laughs> all of your resources, your income, the big the big shovel that you have. Sure. You can completely maximize that. So if you're in your 40s and your 50s and you're listening to this, well, the time is now to get out of debt. In your 20s and 30s, if you're listening, do the right thing so that when you get to your 40s and 50s, you can do these next things that we're going to talk about effectively. Absolutely. So the relationship with debt, like you said, I, I don't, especially with interest rates where they're at now, look, I think no debt is the best debt. But I think we all understand having a mortgage in your 40s and 50s is not the end of the world. Let's talk about some of the other things that we need to probably do before we think about the lake house and things like that. Because 
I'll go back to one of the, or I'll go down to one of the things we haven't talked about yet, which mm-hmm. is practicing enjoying some of your wealth. Right, now. exactly. But when do you do that? Well, okay, let's talk about the savings element. And you just touched on it with the car too. Yep. I, I lump a few of these things in. And if, if you're having trouble getting on track with this stuff, Dave Ramsey, Total Money Makeover is a great book, a great resource. The philosophy, the mentality there is great for getting out of debt. So you can do these things next. From a savings standpoint in your 40s and 50s, what are we telling folks? 15% of your your gross income should be going into retirement accounts. Yeah. Right? And I, I mean, if you're managing your debt well, you know, the cash flow is probably not even going to be noticed. Mm-hmm. Challenge yourself. I mean, if you're saving, let's say 3% in your 401k and nothing else, try to make incremental changes to yeah. increase that. Get yourself built up to, you know, seven, eight, ten percent and eventually get to that fifteen. But the sooner you can get there, the better. Yeah. The math works with fifteen percent almost always. Yeah, it's it's not a magic number. It I've isn't. had clients ask me, why are you stuck on fifteen? And I, I say there's no magic behind the number, but what I found is at fifteen percent, if if you are able to do that, those people are fine in retirement. And quite frankly, Jason, you know, I I think that we see a lot of people that are saving four or five, six percent. Mm-hmm. But the ones that are saving 15% are the ones going, okay, done. Now what? Now now where do I put some of the savings? What's next? Yeah. yeah they're, right. they're at that. That's like the tipping point, I feel like. When you get to that 15%, you're asking, well, how do I save 20? How do I save 25? Right. Those people are going to make it, right? Sure. Something you said just a little bit ago, I think, is a really, really practical way to do it. If you have a 401k and you know it's benefits and enrollment time or whatever, you don't have to wait until then, but you can go out there and, and schedule it automatically, sure. put it on autopilot, which yep. is the best way to do it. Always. To increase your contributions 1% every year. Yep. And the next thing you know, 10 years later, you're contributing 15%, not mm-hmm. thinking about it. You don't miss it 1% a year at a time. Right? You don't. And that goes for any retirement savings. It just has to be automatic. Set up the payment, draft it from your checking account. Have it go into your IRA. Keep the 401ks going. Again, the math works out Mm -hmm. really, really nicely, especially if you start this at 40 or 35 for that matter. Yeah. If if you're not there at age 40, all hope is not not lost. You've got 20 some years worth of your best earning years to really ramp up. So even at 50, the answer is always now, right? Right. But let's let's talk about that client who is at that 15% mark and they're saying, okay, I'm at 15, but I'm still saving money. You know, where do I go next, Jason? I like to call that the retire early bucket. Okay. I mean, that's just what I, I don't, we didn't really talk about no, this. We didn't. <laughs> this is, this one's not really a, I mean, we have, haven't scripted this a whole right. lot. This is just a conversation. So but. You, you're going to have some choices there. Are we putting some extra towards our mortgage? Is our mortgage mm-hmm. taken care of? I kind of want to check that box. Yeah. At least something. But the extra I'm going to put into more of a retire early mentality, it's going to let me maybe bridge a gap from 55 to 59 or Mm -hmm. 57 to 59 before I can take money out of my retirement accounts. I like that other bucket. Now, (laughs) a lot of times the folks that are asking me these questions haven't taken a vacation in 15 (laughs) years. And so I can't have that. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But I'm good with the whole concept of setting money outside of retirement accounts aside for the retire early. And maybe someone really likes their life, their job, and they decide to use that money for something else. Oh, well. Yeah. You know, it's not a bad problem to have. Well, we've talked about inflation and, uh, you know, we're looking at numbers in the eight, nine percent territory sure. and that creeps up every month. We get a report money sitting in savings isn't helping you. So that retire early bucket, Jason, what what kind of things can we do with those? I, not everybody has the same tools in their tool belt. For example, teachers, mm-hmm. they've got some great options, right? Like deferred compensation. Right. You know, that's maybe that's the next place that you go. What if you don't have those kinds of things? What, where do you go next? There's, and I'm kind of baiting you here. <laughs> it's going to be kind of a lead into one of the other things that we talk about. But, you know, we know about non-qualified accounts, mm-hmm. just a regular brokerage account. Mm-hmm. And you can take that money out for whatever you want, right? Deferred comp, things like that. But where else do you go? I don't know where you want me to go. <laughs> I'm not I'm not following. No, I mean, okay. I, I go back to my 401k. I mean, I fill that up too. So, But what are you thinking? Okay, so what, all right, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. What if you have maximized all of your 401k, your IRA, Mm -hmm. you're over the 15%, but you still want to put money somewhere. Where do you go then? Can't put it in your 401k anymore. Now, where are we going? 
I don't know. Where do you want me to go? <laughs> I'm baiting you. This is not fair. <laughs> well, a lot of... I want to go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Traditional schools, a lot of people, this is where people bring up like, well, I mean, we could get into health savings accounts and the cheat code. Oh, that sure. Could be. Yeah, but we yeah. already did an episode yeah, on that. Yeah, sure. 529s, college savings. Sure. This is where I'm going to go into the next one because it's a cash flow thing. Cash flow is probably the best that's in your where 40s my mind and 50s. Is when it comes to college, like paying for college and stuff, my mind is instantly to take care of yourself and cash flow that. Yeah. Okay. So I don't even, I have seven kids. Are so, you going to pay for all of their college? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. How many the, 529s do you have set up? I have zero. All right. Okay. You heard it folks. So I have Between zero, the two of us, we have zero 529s. <laughs> I, I just, I would rather have my financial household like be a fortress Uh and just pay for the college bill as it comes along so much. So it's so much in my psyche. I wasn't taking your bait, you know? Well, it's a good place though. If you are wildly convicted around saving for your child's college education and start putting some money aside for them, Mm -hmm. it's just not my preference. Yeah. Oh, well, we're firm believers and and kids having some skin in the game when it comes to school because I don't know if out there you're listening and, and you're like Jason and I who are a little bit thick headed and we have to learn <laughs> things the hard way. Kids don't appreciate it as much unless they're yeah. invested, right? No. So if mom and dad are writing the checks for college, that's how you end up financing partying for four years with no degree or a general. Which uh, I feel like we, our generation specifically, witnessed so much oh, yeah. of that. There wasn't when I when I graduated high school so long ago now <laughs> that. It wasn't even presented as an option to go to like a vocational school right. or do learn a trade. It, it, that's where the dumb kids want went, and that is just simply not the case. You say the dumb kids, the ones who are the uh, retiring are, are, at forty years old, <laughs> or or telling the kids that partied and financed their partying for four years what to do every day at work. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm I'm not downplaying the value of education at right, all. Right, right. But I, it, and it's this is this is where we'll, we might catch some flack. But I think helping your kids, you don't want your kids to be saddled with student loan debt, especially no. if you've gone through paying back loans and things like that. So it's admirable. But this is where I say, okay, in your 40s or 50s, this is where we're actually looking at kids going to school and things like right. that. That's where I'm a big fan of cash flowing it and not derailing your retirement plans. The best thing that you can do for your kids is not be a financial burden to them down the road. And you got to secure your retirement first. You, yeah, after absolutely. all, you did you did raise them and you fed them and clothed well, them for 18 free, plus right? years. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so yeah, I, I kind of baited you into that a little bit just for the next talking point, but I couldn't wait to set the trap and jump that I, I skipped. I it skipped worked. over part of the savings, Jason. <laughs> and, oh, you and did, you, yeah. Yeah, you, you touched on it about the car and all that kind of stuff. This is when you should be funding sinking accounts. Absolutely. And yeah. now I'm going to let you just go to town on sinking funds yeah. because I know you're a big fan. It sounds like a really fancy thing that hedge fund uh, managers do. <laughs> Jason, what is a sinking fund and how does it apply to 99% of people out there? And, and the way that I look at sinking funds is very simple. It's money I'm going to spend. Yes. Okay. At some point down the road, I'm going to need a roof. Mm-hmm. Okay. Shouldn't be surprised by a roof cave in. Christmas is on the 25th of December every <laughs> year. Okay. I want to go on a vacation with my family. I want to have an anniversary uh, trip with my wife when we have 20 years of marriage. And like, like that's where this money's going. Your 10 year old car at some point is going to need replaced. Yeah, man. Yours is going to need replaced <laughs> soon. <laughs> <One of these> <laughs> I think it's going to hit 300,000 miles. Soon. I, I'm really, I'm really pulling for that. Yeah. Well, you have oars and paddles <laughs> in there. I'm afraid what you have planned, <laughs> but I won't be surprised by it, Jason. In fact, no. when that day comes, I will give her a proper funeral and I will say, <laughs> you never owed me anything. It's been real. I just had a picture of you like pushing your car into the ocean or something. <laughs> I might, I might. With you in it. Oh, uh, come on. <laughs> but these are things, like you said, they come up, they happen. Furnaces go out. They only right. go so long. A roof will only hold up for so long. These are things that we are constantly surprised by, and we have no right to be surprised by no. them. So when you've got extra income mm-hmm. and you're not servicing all this consumer debt, now is the time to plan for those expenses. Yeah, and this isn't like emergency fund money. No. Okay, this is separate from that. Uh, I mean, your roof needing replaced, if it's an emergency, it's probably an insurance claim. Right. Okay. It, it's never, almost never an emergency as because of age. Yeah. Okay. So 
for us, like that's bad planning for 30 years. He's really bad <laughs> planning. Yeah. And, and if you're 27 year old roof, you don't think it needs replaced. You're just wrong. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, sinking funds are a phenomenal tool to have in your arsenal when you're trying to figure out what to do with the excess outside of your retirement plan. So I got ahead of myself here, Jason. You did. We touched on the 15% gross income going into retirement Mm -hmm. before we jump into things like non-qualified accounts, deferred comp, and those things that are available to us that are awesome. And we are chomping at the bit to get money in those things. This is when you establish those sinking funds and make sure that and we'll say air quote emergencies or surprises aren't actually surprises and don't derail you because this is the red zone. These it are is. the retirement. Not to be cliche, I'm just going to go with it, Jason. Uh-oh. I do this all the time. I'm scared. I, I find a stupid analogy and then I just go <laughs> until it doesn't make sense anymore. This is the retirement red zone. And those types of decisions are going to determine whether you kick a field goal or you score a <laughs> touchdown, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that was real bad. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so hugely important. Don't kick a field goal, man. <laughs> when you get into the red zone, you yeah, you want to score touchdowns. That's so right. yeah, you know, you get to that fifteen percent level, you might want to chuck money into these other things, mm-hmm. but you know, when the roof predictably needs replaced, you don't want to have to tap into retirement funds to get it. That's right. Don't yeah. be surprised by these things. And like you said, separate from emergency funds. Emergency funds don't really have a, a name. No. They don't really have an assignment. Your sinking funds should. You should know exactly where that fund is yeah, going. Yeah, that's, I mean, like an emergency fund, like around here would be like, oh my gosh, uh, my septic tank cracked. Yeah. Totally unexpected. Right. Shouldn't have happened. That's totally different. So. Unless you live in town and an inside cat like me, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. But, but you, the sinking fund thing actually ties to the to the thing that we we need to talk about a little bit, which is fun with them. Yes, I mean, it what does. a great transition! I know you're welcome. <laughs> so many setups today. <laughs> well, okay, here's the danger, and it's not a danger really, Jason. But you and I, working with clients who are getting ready to retire, mm-hmm. I see this all the time, and when I approach this, I get a lot of really funny looks. You did the right things in your 20s and 30s and yep. made sure you weren't saddled with debt or you you repented of your debtful ways, right? And you got out and you spent your 40s and your 50s stacking up money, investing for retirement. You've established a lot of really good habits. Here's the problem. You forgot how to spend money. <laughs> you forgot how to enjoy some of what you're accumulating. You forgot to take vacations with your kids and, right. and all those kinds of things. So this is where we're going to say you can kind of start practicing retirement. Sure. Practice enjoying your money. Absolutely. Now, I say you want to do that with a plan, right? Yeah. But Jason, sure. I went to Disney last week with my kids. I didn't think I would have fun there. Turns out it's, it is a pretty happy place. I, <laughs> I had a lot of fun. You know, it makes more sense to set up a sinking fund for Disney so next how time, right? Gonna, how are you going to pay for that credit card bill? Then? So actually, <laughs> I I don't want to. That could be another episode. <laughs> Financing Disney, I feel well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it could be. That's a good idea. We were very. I, we got away very cheap. My that's wife awesome. is an extreme penny pincher. I think people make fun of how tight I am with finances, and she mm-hmm. puts me to shame. So uh, no, we did it very practically. We didn't skimp on any fun or anything like that. But we had a plan definitely going in. But this is. I mean, this this is something that you retire for a reason. Sure. If you don't want to enjoy life, if you don't want to take vacations, if you don't want to spend time with you might as well keep working forever. Yeah. Right? And the, I mean, it's just like the absence of purpose in any retirement plan and really any financial plan is just really bad. It's actually a recipe for disaster, quite right. frankly. So you need to know what that purpose is going to be for you and enjoy life. Go play golf. Do something fun. This this is awesome. This is good stuff. Not every financial advisor is going to do this, but I think you and I both more often than not are encouraging our clients, hey, go buy this. Go take this vacation. Have a little fun. Whereas most advisors would say, you can't be spending any more money. Yeah. You or or if you got extra, put it here, put it here. You have to enjoy, you know, the the hard work that you, you put into being ready to sure. retire and, and actually it's not freedom if if you don't enjoy it. That's right. right. Yep. Uh, that was a very non-eloquent way of putting things. <laughs> you got to practice retirement a little bit in these red zone years. And you might find what, 
what your purpose is in retirement. You find might find out that you love international travel. You might think that you want to do that. Right. And you take a couple trips and go, mm, not for me. Yeah, I'm going to sit by right? my pond and, and, and maybe drink, and maybe I'd rather fashion. right. Maybe I'd rather have a pool <laughs> and uh, you know spend my retirement drinking barrel aged gin martinis exactly. or something. Well, so that's not my retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is uh, this is I think the make or break period. Your 40s and your 50s, and we didn't even really talk about the catch ups, which you don't want to miss out on. At age 50, you can contribute more to your IRAs. You can yep. contribute more to your 401ks than the average yeah, Joe. Yeah, get advice. Well, yeah. If you haven't gotten advice and you're you're in this stage. Get advice. Now's the time to start working with yeah, an advisor. Yeah, there's some nuances that are It's pretty important. <laughs> so turns out we have an affinity for that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, this I had fun awesome. with this one. I think the next one's going to be really fun, Jason. But uh, Do, is that a, What's our drink? I don't know yet. Huh? <laughs> it's going to have uh, barrel-aged gin it's in it, It's going to have though. gin in it. <laughs> Freedom. Go ahead. It's, yeah. Freedom! <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, thanks for having a drink with us this week. It's time to close out the tab. If you have a question or a topic you want addressed on the Old Fashioned Finance podcast, be sure to email us at speakeasy at oldfashionedfinance.com. We'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to share the show with someone you love or just someone who needs a little money muddling themselves. You can stay up to date with the latest action by following us on Facebook and Instagram. Old Fashioned Finance is brought to you by Blue Jay Financial Group. That's BlueJayFG.com and produced by Pottery Studios. We've been your hosts, Jason and Caleb. Quack, quack. Cheers, brother. <laughs> well, quack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go with it. Quack, quack. <laughs> Till next time. Blue Jay Financial Group, LLC, Blue Jay, is a registered investment advisor registered with the state of Ohio. Registration does not imply a certain level of skill or training. The presence of this advertisement on this podcast shall not be directly or indirectly interpreted as a solicitation of investment advisory services to persons of another jurisdiction unless otherwise permitted by statute. Follow-up or individualized responses to consumers in a particular state by Blue Jay in the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation shall not be made without first complying with jurisdiction requirements or pursuant to an applicable state exemption. All verbal and written content on this presentation is for information purposes only. Opinions expressed herein are solely those of Blue Jay, unless otherwise specifically cited. Material presented is believed to be from reliable sources and no representations are made by our firm as to other parties' informational accuracy or completeness. All information or ideas provided should be discussed in detail with an advisor, accountant, or legal counsel prior to implementation.